What's up everyone, it's Endymion, and things have gone from crazy to insane in a really short period of time. Not only has the entire discourse surrounding the baby gone nuclear, but now it's attracted some legit organizations involved as well. From Homeland Security getting involved with, and officially calling what's happening right now as Gamergate 2, an ex-sweet baby writer being exposed for being openly racist, a game developer article proving themselves wrong, and more examples. There's a ton to go over today, so let's just start with that Homeland Security story, because it's wild. From Bounding into Comics, we have this article titled, U.S. Government-Funded Nonprofit Take This Response to Sweet Baby Inc. Backlash, by calling on video game industry to clearly and unequivocally denounce Gamergate. Firstly, let's properly understand what the hell is going on here. Homeland Security has many branches to their organization, with each specializing in different kinds of threats or security. In terms of video games, one of these branches is a non-profit organization called Take This, which according to them they are described as a mental health organization providing comprehensive resources, support, and consultation tailored for the unique needs of the game development community. So they're kind of like a gigantic therapist group that exists to mediate and help video game studios and the developers within them, Come to terms with and understand the discourse that's targeting them. This could be from hate mail, DMs, and harassment campaigns to name a few. Of course, Take This has officially declared what is happening to Sweet Baby Inc. as being a targeted harassment campaign and they even unironically refer to it as Gamergate 2. Which I remember making a thumbnail before when this first started with those exact words on it and to be honest with you, that thumbnail was kind of a joke. I didn't think it would explode like this. But here we are, fellas. We are officially in the second era of Gamergate, it seems. Which, need I remind you, the first Gamergate happened because bad actors within games attempted to strong-arm their influence into the industry. Then after years of silence, their power and ideologies have all but found their way into pretty much every single Western gaming studio imaginable. And with companies like Sweet Baby, Weird Ghost, Baby Ghost, Cozy Comet, and more, which were all started by and funded by Eileen Holoka and Jenny Faber. Two individuals who unironically refer to themselves as white settlers living on indigenous land in Canada. So the self-hatred and virtue signaling not only runs deep, but it emanates from individuals like this who consider themselves white saviors. And before anyone tries to say what I'm doing or saying here is somehow harassment, it isn't. I'm simply showing you what's going on here and who's involved. I didn't start these companies, I didn't make the awful decisions that are plaguing video games today. But of course, many in the games industry will have you believe that all of this was started by the players themselves and not the other way around. As always, whenever bad actors get ousted, they run hit pieces and campaigns to change the narrative surrounding the situation. And if you go to any of these mainstream media news outlets who've come in defense of Sweet Baby and others, they all conveniently forget why this Gamergate 2 nonsense is happening to begin with. They like to say it was because of a Steam Curator tool that compiles which games they worked on. But that tool would have just been something small and whatever if nobody paid any attention to it. Of course, instead, Chris Kindred, who works at Sweet Baby, attempted to strong-arm Steam into banning the tool and then banning the user as well. Which then, of course, the Streisand effect happened and now we are where we are. So none of this would have happened had a Sweet Baby employee not tried to use their influence to silence a user on Steam. It was never the other way around. Of course, you have this now infamous article from GameDeveloper.com titled, Why are Valve and Discord permitting harassment against Sweet Baby Inc.? Steam and Discord are being used as a home base for hateful reactionaries to single out and harass game developers. This article, which is written by this person, Bryant Francis, attempts to, like the rest of the game's industry, try to paint what's happening as a harassment campaign that evolved out of nowhere, but like I said, we know why it began in the first place. What I find very interesting is, within this very same article on GameDev.com, they prove that the Steam Curator tool itself does nothing nefarious or illegal whatsoever. They said in their own article here, when word of the curation group Sweet Baby Inc. detected first surfaced on social media, it seemed like a joke. What was the point of making a curation page detecting games that a consulting company worked on, especially when the games are listed on their site? Thank you, Brian, for proving the very point thousands of players around the world are trying to get through your thick skulls. Exactly, the tool itself does nothing bad since it does, like you say, just compiles a list of games, 
that Sweet Baby's founders compile themselves on their own website of their own free will. There are plenty of tools on Steam. Some compile lists of every game that has de nouveau. You'll also find tools that compile every game that Activision has worked on or Square Enix, or whichever other developer or publisher too. None of these tools are inherently bad. They are simply specialized versions of search engine optimizations that any consumer on Steam can use to more effectively sift through the thousands of games that are on Steam. And stuff like De Nuvo, which is an anti-tamper and digital management system, basically anti-cheat is what it is, so you can track all the games that have De Nuvo in it. Yet even if some may look at De Nuvo and frown upon it, De Nuvo's developers obviously didn't attack anyone for making the curator tool in the first place. Because if they did, then obviously it would have sparked controversy industry-wide. When it comes to Sweet Baby, compiling their games is again not harassment if they do it themselves too. The only reason why this would be seen as bad in their eyes is because they don't want people to know which games they've worked on. And if they were actually proud of their work and knew what they were doing was for the betterment of the video games industry, then it would be fine. But they know, as you and I do, that what they're doing is largely disingenuous and has actively made many games worse in response. And other consulting groups like Black Girl Gamers, which worked on Forspoken, obviously were paid to work on Square Enix's game. And all they ended up doing was making an unlikable asshole of a main character in Frey. And the users can't be blamed for why characters like Frey are unlikable since her existence, mannerisms, identity, and everything was controlled, molded, and finalized by Black Girl Gamers. Who obviously, as their name suggests, they specialize in Black Character Consulting. It's also suspicious that of course games that have been worked on by Sweet Baby have closed studios like Volition when it came to Saints Row's remake. And they've tanked other franchises with nonsense like Suicide Squad as well. So clearly, pretty much unanimously across the board, everything they work on just gets worse and even sometimes results in hundreds of people losing their jobs and the entire studio going under. One of the biggest outspoken people on this entire thing has been Grums over on Twitter. He led the original team that made World of Warcraft into the global phenomenon that it was and produced games like Diablo and Starcraft. He was recently on the Quarterings channel talking about this stuff, and I won't show everything he said here of course, but here's just a small bit that kind of shows you why we are where we are. So, please listen. It's not that gamers are, you know, uh, uh, upset about, you know, oh hey, we have some diversity in the game. It's actually the way that they go about it with pure tokenism, with phoning in weak characters instead of creating strong new characters. And more importantly, it's about a vindictiveness to destroy the past, to destroy the IP, to ignore the source material, and to tear apart these beloved characters in some sort of fitful rage that we don't understand and is very disingenuous. And I think that is the tremendous reaction to Suicide Squad. And this is going to have an immense uh, financial impact. Uh, the way games are funded, you don't use your own money, even EA, okay? It, it, games are hugely expensive to make. They're, they're upwards of, you know, 250, sometimes $600 million. It's yeah. for certain live games. It's incredibly how expensive they are. And to do that, uh, your CFO is your best friend. You're counting on your CFO to get you tax breaks, to get you in, to put studios in regions which are financially favorable, and you will borrow the cheap money. You will get as cheap money to do it. Even EA does this. I, I worked with EA. Uh, we were putting together a deal where they were taking um, bailout money from the banks in the last uh, financial crisis that we had, and they were applying that cheap money towards games. Same thing with COVID money. They're applying that cheap money towards games. And what has been the cheapest money while interest rates were still low, you know, a couple of years ago? It yeah. was ESG financing. And so they're going to take this money and they're going to put it into games. But now that they don't have that money anymore because ESG is either being diminished or rebranded because the returns on investment have been so poor on Wall Street for ESG funds that that source of revenue is drying it up. This woke machine cannot continue in the way that it is now for AAA gaming. And I think, unfortunately, it's so entrenched that you're not going to see you're going to you're not going to see much of an ability to course correct because the studios are yeah, so they're just going to shut down, right? They're going to shut down. Yeah. And this this is truly the rise of double A gaming or what some of my fans call S tier gaming. This is, you know, like Helldivers. 
Stuff like Helldivers, like Power yeah. World, uh, the, the mm-hmm. Diablo West Power game World, that yeah. came out. I forget the name of that. Uh, really incredible success stories in a, in a period where game companies are experiencing significant losses. This The bleeding will continue until, and no one's going to wake up from it, unfortunately. It's going to be a total nosedive. And as you can see from Grums himself, the reason why ESG funding has become so prevalent in games was simply because it was the cheapest way to invest in the future of video games around five years or so ago. So to put it in other terms, look at it this way. You're at the grocery store. You see two packs of beef. One is the premium good stuff. It's the real deal, but it's also expensive. It costs a lot of money to buy. But you know that that steak sirloin is top quality. That's the people and devs you would hire that would give you the successes like we've seen so many times in the past. Then you see this other piece of meat at the grocery store. It's not very good quality, but it is still beef. You know it's really cheap, but ah, maybe you can get the job done. I mean, sure, it's not the sirloin top shelf stuff, but you'll try it. So you buy and you eat the cheap meat and you feel sick after and you end up blowing chunks out of both ends. That's the ESG funds. That's these consulting groups, the sweet babies and so on. These companies attempted to make things for cheaper using less qualified individuals and it resulted in worse products made for no one that aren't selling. And combine that with the already bloated budgets for video games as it already is and you have a recipe for utter disaster. But unfortunately for game dev studios and publishers, once these consulting groups get in bed with them, they're very hard to get rid of. They're kind of like herpes. They're always there and you just kind of have to live with it. That's sweet baby, basically. And like Grum said here, really isn't a way for these studios or publishers to get rid of these consultants if they maybe have a contract with them or whatever else. And they've become so embedded within the industry and the inner circles that they are now just a part of the ecosystem and these groups forever. And ultimately, the only way to flush them out is unfortunately the only way it ever works. Which is that whatever these parasites are attached to, you have to essentially burn down the host to kill the infection once and for all. God damn, I'm just throwing out metaphors today, but here's another one for you. Sweet Baby is the zombie virus. The studios are a human survivor. The studio has been bitten by the baby. Do you risk the human survivor coming back to camp with you and maybe hopefully they feel better? Or do you just put them out of their misery and not risk complete destruction of everything? Sadly, that's what's going to happen likely as Grum says himself. These groups are so intrinsically tied to these studios and their connections that for example, let's look at Rocksteady. You really think that their next game after Suicide Squad, if they even manage to live long enough to make it to their next game, which isn't likely. But if that does happen, do you honestly think that the next game won't also have Sweet Baby involved? It absolutely will. So what then? How do you get rid of the rot that permeates throughout Rocksteady and Sweet Baby? The only definitive answer is that Rocksteady would have to close shop entirely. And once these funds run out and the games that aren't being bought like Suicide Squad, which bombed at release and is already heavily discounted, the end result is a graveyard of studios and thousands of people being laid off due to this monolithic machine that we call video games. Of course, these groups and even that Homeland Security branch will gaslight you into believing that it isn't Sweet Baby's fault, that every game they worked on is objectively bad or worse than previous iterations without them, instead it's somehow the players. Just listen here to what Take This, that Homeland branch says about this whole situation, and I quote, This joint project from the Center on Terrorism, Extremism, and Counterterrorism, Take This seeks to develop a shared framework for understanding extremism in games. This includes the development of a set of best practices and centralized resources for monitoring and evaluation of extremist activities, as well as a series of training workshops for the monitoring, detection, and prevention of extremist exploitation in gaming spaces for community managers, multiplayer designers, lore developers, mechanic designers, and trust and safety professionals. In addition, this project will provide a first-of-its-kind collaborative structure for public-private partnerships on preventing and mitigating games-based extremism. Taken together, this project will simultaneously improve counter-extremism collaboration in the video game industry, while also providing substantial capacity building within and across developers. If you're reading this, you've probably been hearing about what's now being called Gamergate 2. It's the latest targeted harassment campaign within the game industry and it's aimed at Sweet Baby Inc., a Montreal-based narrative development studio. The campaign has also been impacting entities and games associated with Sweet Baby, journalists covering the issue, and others associated in various ways with the targets. 
You also may be at a loss to know how to talk about this issue and what, if anything, you can do about it. That's where we come in. Discord, Steam, and X have been the predominant platforms where the abuse and harassment has been taking place. In these spaces, lists of game studios, companies, and associated organizations are being circulated for targeting by members of the mob. Large-scale harassment campaigns like this are fueled by political events. As political rhetoric heats up ahead of the U.S. presidential election later this year, this kind of online activity is going to ramp up and it's important to understand that these phenomena are interrelated, end quote. So, yes, you heard that right. This Homeland Security branch is actually attempting to tie the backlash towards Sweet Baby and Wokeness as somehow being the result of right-wing extremism and the upcoming election in their eyes. This backlash isn't because Sweet Baby attempted to silence a user for simply compiling their games. Of course not. It is the result of thousands of extremists like yourself, apparently, who are to blame. This is damage control unlike we've ever seen it before, my friends. This is genuinely insane and very telling that the games industry would rather burn itself to the ground instead of admitting that what they're doing is alienating and objectively making their art worse. There was this one dev who spoke on Gamergate 2 and what they say just proves why things are so bad. Their name is Joe Torado. Don't harass this person by the way. I honestly think Joe is just confused and by what he tweeted here, that seems to be the case. I'm not even mad at Joe or anything. I just think he doesn't really know what he's saying here, but here's what he said. As a person who advocates for diversity in games, this whole thing is laughable. We have had exactly one female protagonist in the top 25 best-selling games of the last three years. That list also includes only one Latino. That's not forced diversity. There is no diversity at all. Again, I don't hate Joe or anything, but dude, you just proved why the virtue signaling in the games industry is pointless with your own logic. If only one game in the top 25, as you say, had your pandering quota in it, and the other 24 examples sold extremely well because they didn't pander, then did you not just prove that by not pandering, you make a product that ends up being for more people in the end anyway? And by not pandering, millions of people will want to buy your game, and when you do pander, like you said, you don't even make it into the top 25 best-selling games of any given year. Dude, you just proved our point while pointlessly virtue signaling yourself. Again, I don't blame you. You're likely just another dev being strong-armed and drenched in identity politics 24-7. But you do realize what you said is objectively why Gamergate 2 is kind of happening, right? And you admit in your own weird way that by pandering, you just end up making a product for less people, which will not only cause it to sell less, but will likely set it up for failure. How do these people say these things and not realize that they're self-owning themselves like this? Just don't harass Joe, he's very confused, but at least he agrees with the players in his own little weird way that kind of disassembles his own argument. It's just incredible stuff all around. It's like a sniper shooting at an enemy soldier and then ricocheting the bullet somehow and shooting himself in the head. It's amazing that they don't realize what they're doing is more harm than good. Of course, there was this other developer who got dogpiled for admitting that they were openly racist when it came to how they make games and how they hire people. Also from Bounding Into Comics, ex Sweet Baby Inc. employee and current EA Marvel's Black Panther narrative designer, seen proudly bragging that previous title Validate had no white people on dev team. This person's name is Danny Lalanders, who worked on some dating sim game called Validate, which likely none of you played. I mean, here's some screenshots, I guess, of the game, and it's a visual novel dating sim that features nothing but black people in it. Anyway, this Danny person said openly that they went out of their way to not hire anyone who wasn't exactly like them, but let's hear what they have to say themselves. So here, listen. I have a team of 21 right now uh, for Validate. It's a pretty big team. It's a crazy big team for indie games. But who is your team? Validate has a team of mostly people, mostly all people of color. We have no white people on our team. Um, I did that because I wanted to create a safe environment. And I know the best way for an environment to be safe is to be around people who are just like me. Um, and I'm not saying that white people in the industry are creating safe, unsafe environments. I'm not saying that. That is not what I'm saying. I am saying that sometimes it is hard to work with white people because they think that something may be okay, but it was really a microaggression. And no one wants to deal with that while they are trying to make a game that they love. 
I mean, what can I even add to this, really? The person here is objectively racist and admits that they went out of their way to only hire people who looked and thought exactly as they do when it comes to making video games. Obviously, if a white dev said these same things, they would be crucified, so it's incredible how EA still hasn't fired this person yet. And to no one's surprise, this Danny person is also an ex-employee of Sweet Baby Inc., so it all makes sense. And likely whenever this Black Panther game is released, it's going to be the most pandering anti-white video game you've ever seen. I'm genuinely looking forward to its release. Not to play it, mind you, but just to see how nuclear level of a product it ends up becoming. And unfortunately, this sort of mentality like this Danny individual is what is being championed and encouraged in video games today. You can discriminate, alienate, and push people out of industries as long as they're white men and women, I guess. And these companies and security groups will defend these people who are openly racist while condemning and gaslighting the millions of players out there who actually support the industry itself with their money and fandom. They actually believe the gaming industry will exist and thrive by attacking the paying customer across the board into submission. It's a bold move, fellas, I gotta admit, but it won't end well for them. However many times I gotta say it, I will. You never attack your audience ever. Because without them, you're nothing. And I think a lot of these studios and publishers are about to learn the hard way that you'd never do this. Plus, them threatening us by saying you won't get new games if these studios don't thrive? Do you have any idea who you're talking to? Us players have insane backlogs. If anything, a good three or five months of no new games would allow us to catch up on the other things we bought already. Plus, this entire year, outside of playing Fortnite with some friends, all I've been playing pretty much is Japanese games anyways. I have like 81 hours in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, and the only Western games I've been playing this year are older ones like the Batman Arkham games. So go ahead, don't release anything new, not that it matters anyways. In 2024 alone, pretty much every single major release so far in Success Story, from Pal World to Tekken and more, none of them are even being made in the West anyway. And we got stuff like Dragon's Dogma 2 coming as well. I haven't even started like a Dragon Infinite Wealth yet either. And then I got The Legend of Nayuta, Boundless Trails from last year that I bought, Unicorn Overlord came in the mail recently too, like, I'm good dude. I got plenty to play already, and if you're going to threaten me or others by saying games like a Black Panther video game made by an openly racist narrative designer like this will be affected, oh no, how will I ever recover from that? This Gamergate 2 electric boogaloo nonsense all started because a consulting group attempted to silence the voice of a person for making a search engine optimization tool. That's what it is. So they can gaslight you, lie, and try to shift the truth in whatever way they want to, but the truth is that no one is going to believe these lies. The Streisand effect has gone ultra instinct at this point, and these companies can lie all they want. There's far too many people now that know the truth. So either make great games without pandering and survive, or keep burning these bridges and running yourselves into the ground. Either way, the players are winning regardless, because we just won't buy your games and we won't support you. And it's not because we're racist, actually it's because some of these people in these companies are instead. And I know the rot runs deep and devs are tired because I got them in my DMs talking to me almost every single day. So you can try to gaslight me too, but I know the truth. And there's nothing you can do but respect your audience, and if that's too much, well, I guess we'll see what happens. So hold on to your butts, fellas, this is about to get nutty, but I want you to know that you are in the right. You are not in the wrong here, and you deserve quality products for your time and money. Never let anyone tell you otherwise, because we deserve better, and we will not stoop to their level. So don't harass these people, don't engage with them, just read what they say, laugh, and then go enjoy some quality video games that don't adhere to this nonsense. And until they accept the truth, we'll just keep going. This isn't a movement of hate as they want you to believe. This is a battle for the soul of a medium that we all love with our hearts. So thank you for watching, subscribe, like, and share the video, and have a wonderful day. Thanks to my patrons as always, and I'll see you in the next one.